idea of the commandments that follow the Ten Commandments. So we have the Ten Commandments, and then after the Ten Commandments, next week's parsha is Mishpatim, is the civil law, with, with tens of mitzvot. But after the Ten Commandments, in this week's parsha, there is two or three commandments. And we want to focus on those commandments, at least one of them, the last one in this parsha, to think about how does this capture um, the purpose of the giving of a Torah, and why is it placed right where it is. And, this, and it's going to be the commandment that you should make an altar of earth. We'll get to that. But then the key feature that he tells you, doesn't tell you anything about it, but he tells you it has to have a ramp, not stairs. Why does it have to have a ramp, not stairs? So there are all kinds of interpretations. I'm going to tell you the Kabbalistic interpretation that I have not seen until this week. So it's, uh, it's fresh, fresh, fresh and exciting. Um, before that, I saw another beautiful interpretation from um, the Rebbe's father, Rabbi Levi Yitzchak. And that is, again, the, in the introduction to the giving of the Torah, where God tells the people that, <clears throat> God tells Moshe to tell the people that we're going to be a what? Well, we call it a chosen nation, but God doesn't really say chosen nation. If you look throughout the Torah, God, the, the, God, God never says the words chosen nation. Moshe says, God shows us to be, to be an Am Segula. What is an Am Segula? So that's what we want to think about. So we'll give you the Rashi's interpretation, and then we'll give you the Kabbalistic interpretation. So I'm just opening up the verses here. I'm just going to read you. I'm not going to read too much inside. Just a, just a phrase here. Um, so I'm looking at Exodus chapter 19, verse, I guess we could start to make it po more poetic. We could start from verse four, really, we could start from verse three. Okay, start from verse three, why not? Some poetry in the morning won't hurt. Both, um, chapter 19, verse three, Moses ascended to God. This is pre the giving of the Torah. Basically, from when the Jewish people came to Sinai, every day was a preparation for the giving of the Torah. And every day, almost every day, Moshe descended from the mountain with a new message. So this is, this happened to be, um, I'm pretty sure this happens to be this. Yeah, this happens to be the second day of Sivan. So it's a few days before the giving of the Torah, which was on the sixth of Sivan. In any case, Moses ascended to God and Hashem called to him from the mountain saying, so shall you say to the house of Jacob and relate to the children of Israel. Um, what should he say? Tell them you have seen what I did to Egypt. And what I have become, and what I have be born, and that I have borne you on the wings of eagles and brought you to me. So this is the metaphor of God gathering the Jews from all over Egypt and bringing them to the exit point and leaving Egypt. So God puts us on the on the on the wings of eagles. Verse five. And now, if you hearken well to me, if you listen. And observe my, my covenant. You shall be to me the most beloved treasure of all peoples. This is how the, English, the arts world translates. Um, the Hebrew word is segula. What is segula? That's what Rashi says. Otsar chaviv, a treasured, uh, a, a beloved treasure. Make no mistake, don't think that the Jewish people are the only people that have a relationship with God. So the verse continues, for mine is the entire world. So Rashi says, mine, my, mine is the entire world. In other words, um, that really applies that God is the God of everybody. But in any case, the word segula, the word segula seems to, to be, Rashi says it's a treasure. There's a Kabbalistic interpretation of the word segula, which is interesting, and it's why, and it's related to the connect to, 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 to the giving of a Torah because it captures the purpose and, um, I don't want to say the purpose, but it captures what the Torah is. And the interpretation is as follows. The interpretation is you have to look at what does the word segol mean? So one of the meanings of segol, segol is also the name of one of the vowels. And in Hebrew, you have the letters and then you have the vowels and the vowels are just symbols. And the symbol of the segol is a symbol of two dots beside each other. 
and then one dot on the bottom. So it's almost like a triangle. It's a triangle, but not with lines, with dots. So you have right side, left side, and then bottom center. That's a sego. And what the Kabbalah says is that the sego represents what Torah is. And it also represents why the Jewish people receive the Torah, right? Remember, we're still, we, we want to be consistent with the simple meaning. What is God saying? God is saying, I'm giving you the Torah because you are an Am Segula. You are a nation of what? Of a treasure. But what is the treasure? Of Segol. So what is the thing that the Jewish people are able to do and the other nations were not able to do and therefore the Jewish people get the Torah? So the Kabbalah is going to say it's the concept of Segol, the concept of three, the concept of um, two extremes and then balancing it in the center. And in short, we always talk about this, so you know, according to the Kabbalah, there's the world of chaos and the world of order. And the world of chaos is where the emotions are very powerful. And when the emotions are very powerful, people are extremists. In other words, when I'm angry, I'm an angry intense, in, in, intensely. When I'm kind, I'm kind completely. I go beyond everything. I go do kindness to people who are undeserving. When I am um, judgmental, I'm judgmental of everybody. I don't see good in everybody. That is the model of the person, the world of chaos, which is strong emotion. And strong emotion is divide, strong energy, I should say. And strong emo, the energy usually separates into two. And, and that's specifically, that's the world of, of chaos. But what happens is individual person at an individual time is in one of those two. An individual culture is in one of those two extremes. And what, we, what, what the Kabbalah says is the world of order you have to introduce the third element. And the third element is what balances the two extremes and allows them to communicate, diminishes the light and creates balance. So what we're gonna say is that that is the model of the Torah. The Torah in every area is gonna find the middle path, gonna find the balance and going to move us away from that intense emotion to allow for the positive balance of the world of order. So just to elaborate a, li a, li a little bit, um, to elaborate a little bit is the idea that we have the Medrash. There's a, there's a, there's a, there's a verse as follows. A verse when, when, when God talks about when, when Moshe in the, in the final day of his life, when he blesses the Jewish people, he, before he blesses the tribes, he describes God's love to the people and he describes the event of the giving of the Torah. And this is how he describes it. Are you ready? So here he goes. So I'm going to, I'm turning to the last portion of the Torah, page 11, uh, 13, if you want to look, but you don't have to look. Um, here we go. This is the blessing that Moses, the man of God, bestowed upon the children of Israel before his death. What's the introduction? Verse two, he said, Hashem came from Sinai, having shown forth to them from Seir, having appeared to them from Mount Paran. having approached with some of the holy myriads, some of the holy myriads from his right hand, he presented the fiery Torah to them. Very poetic. What's the verse saying? So there's a medrash which you may have heard. The medrash is that before God gave the people the Torah, he went to other nations and he asked them, do you want the Torah? And the people said, no, what's in the Torah? And God gave them specific commandments, mentioned specific commandments, and they said, okay, we're not interested. And then he came to the Jews. And the joke was the Jews said, knew how much does it cost? God said, it's free. So they said, okay, give us two. So we got, the, we got two tablets. But that's only a joke. The joke is that God came to the Jews. And the, and the Jews said, yeah, we accept the Torah. So what's happening here, this, this Medrash is based on the verse that I just read. Because it says God came from Sinai. But it, where did he show up from Sinai? He appeared from Seir. What's Seir? Seir is the land of Edom, the land where Esav was, the nation that was descends from Jacob's brother Esav. And then it says, having appeared from Mount Paran. Where is Paran? Ah, Paran is Yishmael. Where Yishmael is from, Avram's other descendants. And God comes to the Jewish people. We're well, not necessarily his first choice. And they're saying he gave other people a shot first. He went to Seir. He went to Paran. They didn't want it. God had no choice yet to come to us. Okay. So what is the Medrash? What is the Medrash really telling us, according to the Kabbalah? What's the Medrash really saying? We're better than, how, in what way are we better than Seir and Paran? So what the Kabbalah is going to say, look, 
Seir and Paran each had their own nature. The children of Esav, Esav is Gevura, Esav is strength. Paran, Yishmael, Yishmael was Chesed, Yishmael was love. And if you are either strength or love, the Torah is going to make you uncomfortable. Why? Because the Torah is not extreme love and is not extreme strength. It's not extreme discipline and it's not extreme a love. What is the Torah? The Torah is all about balance. So the people who their culture is one extreme, then they can't handle the Torah. They say, we don't want it. Now, the most interesting point of this, of this idea is what does it say? So he went to Seir, he went to Paran. Then he came to Sinai with some of the myriads of his angels. Then what does it say? The end of the verse two, from his right hand, he presented a fiery Torah. What does it mean? His right hand, he presented a fiery Torah. Says that Rebbe's father, Rabbi Levi Yitzchak, he says like this. He says, what does right represent? Right represents chesed, kindness. What does fire represent? Gvura, strength, discipline. What is the Torah? Both right hand and fire. Oh, that's the Torah at Sinai. That's what the people are willing to accept. And that was different. That's why the children of Yishmael and the children of, of Seir are not, don't, and the children of Esav don't want to accept the Torah. Why not? Not because nothing in the Torah is appealing. No, there is something in the Torah that's appealing. That part of the Torah that's appealing to their nature. But Torah is balance. And to have that balance, which means sometimes you can make kindness and sometimes you need discipline. And that's really the, that's really the balanced life of Torah. And there's positive mitzvot and there's negative mitzvot, and everything is balanced. You have to love God, but you also have to fear God, right? There's always the paradox and always the balance. And that balance is the middle path, which Maimonides says is the right way to go. And that's what the that middle path is what allows for the, to bring God into this world, the fusion of the both extremes, and that creates tikkun and order. Now, going back to the verse, you will be for me a segula, you will be for me a treasured people. So the Kabbalistic interpretation, segula means, look at those, that, look at that, the word segula comes from the word segol, which is that vowel. And the vowel is, segol is the two dots and the two extremes, and the middle and the bottom is the one that merges the two. Now, to merge the two, it's difficult because you have to go beyond yourself. And that's the hard part. So it's very easy to live your life based on your nature. But to go beyond your nature, that's what's difficult. That's what the Jews were prepared to do. Were, were prepared to do, And that's why they get the Torah. And that's the purpose of the Torah. So it's not two, which represents the extre extremities, but it's the three. It's the balance. And um, that is that really captures what the purpose of the Torah is. And then it also captures what the Jewish people were prepared to do. I hope we live up to this and we should continue to live up to this. But that's, that's the three over the two. Two represents extremes and three represents, represents the balance. So we have a Torah, both of fire and of, and of um, both the fire and of the discipline. So just going back to that Medrash for a minute. So the Medrash says, God comes to the children of Yishmael and he says, do you want the Torah? So the children of Yishmael say, what does it say in the Torah? So he says, it says in the Torah, you can't commit adultery. So they say, forget it, we don't want it. Why? Why they're so promiscuous? Not because they're bad people, because by nature they're loving. And by nature it's chesed, it's love is flowing. And that's who they are. They can't balance their passion or their commitment to their love to one person. Okay, so that's not for them. Then you go to then he goes to the children of Yishma of A7. And he says, they say, what does it say in the Torah? He says, Lot Tzach, you can't kill. They say, no, we're strong. And when we don't like something, when someone gets upset, and we have judgment, we have severity, and if we have to kill, we'll kill. You can't tell us not to kill. And what does the Torah say? The Torah says you have to love and you have to have strength, but it has to be in the balance. And that's, and, that, and, that's really, and, that's really number, and that's really the number three. And the number three is the way we uh, really transform the world. And that's that why God tells us we'll be segula, we'll be a cherished people, but the Kabbalistic interpretation will be the people that is able to bridge both extremes and create the balance based on the Torah. That's point number one. Any comments, questions, jokes? Uh, please share. Otherwise, we continue. Rabbi, it's Bob. Uh, you, you've not mentioned Yaakov, which who is the the personification of Tiferet. Uh, yeah. Do you want to do you want to tie him? Yeah. In there? Let's talk about Yaakov for a second. It's interesting that um, that that the, um, God goes to the each of the sons of Abraham. Both Abraham and Isaac each had a son. 
one way to say it is they were only successful with 50% of their children. Avram even less because he had more children later. They had a very low success rate, 50% or less. Um, Yaakov has success with all of his children. Not that they're always righteous. Some of them sin. Some of them sell their brother as a slave, etc. But when I say he's successful, I mean they all remain within the fold. They all remain loyal to his legacy and his teachings. So why does that happen? So the Kabbalistic answer is like this. The answer is that Abraham and Isaac, both Abraham and Isaac, both were holy. And they were indeed holy, but they were really served God with one quality. And therefore, Abraham with love and Yitzchak with, with awe. And therefore, even though they were holy, there was no negative ramification from their own love. But because they only had that one level of holiness, that own, own level of holiness, so their descendants, in other words, when you take that quality and you extend it outside, then it could become corrupt. Like the idea of love. Avram's love is directed to God. But then his son's love also, just like Abraham, I'm such a loving person. Avram's love extended to God and extended to inviting guests, etc. So Yishmael just takes it a little bit further and it becomes what? It becomes um, adultery. It becomes loving without any boundaries. Now the same thing with Isaac. What is Yaakov? Yaakov, according to the Kabbalah, is the fusion of Avram and Yitzchak. He's the fusion of both. And therefore his children, they have the balance. And because they have the balance, they're far from perfect but they can now be the people who will be the patriarchs of, uh, patriarch, they're, the, they're the leaders of the tribes that become the Jewish people. Why? Because they were so better than their uncles? No, because Jacob has this concept of Jacob was the first, first one who represents the fusion of the, of the chesed and gavura, the kindness and the severity, which makes tiferet, which makes beauty. So it's another way of saying, the segol is another way of saying, of saying uh, tiferet. It's, it's uh, synonymous. But it's interesting that when God says, you will be to me, a what? What, 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 what is special about the Jews? And in the context of why are they getting the Torah? So here the Kabbalah says, segula. What does segula mean? Well, Rashi says it means a treasure. Fine, but a treasure doesn't tell me what's in the treasure. Treasure just means it's, it's valuable. But in what way is it valuable? What, God, di diamonds, rubies, what, what's in there? We don't know. So, so here the Kabbalah says, segul means three. And it's that ability to find the balance. And it's very hard because when people are passionate, people, it's, it's really going beyond the nature. Some people have a nature of, of being um, giving. Some people have a nature of discipline. And the Torah makes everybody uncomfortable because it's the middle path. You have to have balance. And when I'm feeling one thing, I have to balance it with the other feeling. I have to love God, but be in awe. I have to give charity, but I also have to defend justice and um, defend self um, property rights, right? So I got this balance. So the fascists don't like us, the socialists don't like us, that nobody likes us, everybody, nobody likes us. We're the middle path. And that's the segula, the willingness to balance and seek balance, which basically does not follow my own nature and does not follow my own extreme passions. And that hopefully will lead us, I mean, that's the, <laughs> if we follow it, that's the way to bring um, healing to the world. Thank you. Okay, now I'm gonna talk about uh, um, the mitzvah that I alluded to earlier that we cannot have a ramp on the altar. Um, I'm so excited about it because um, I'm not like Rabbi Lezben Azariah said. Rabbi Lezben Azariah said I'm almost like 70 years I'm almost 40 years and I have never seen this teaching. So I was surprised, I was happy to find it. The Rebbe, the Rebbe taught this and it's really a discourse, a very short discourse from Rabbi, the Alta Rebbe, Rabbi Schneer Zalman. Rabbi Schneer Zalman wrote it in four lines. The Rebbe said it in a line, in a page and a half. So at least we get a little bit more, more elaboration, but it's interesting, it's inter inter interesting because it's a new dimension and it helps us put into con con context why this, why this mitzvah is so important. So what I'm doing now is I'm turning to the last page of this week's parsha, where there was fire and thunder and lightning and the greatest revelation, and it's wonderful. Everything is, uh, everything is uh, we have this great intense revelation of God, and how do the people respond? They say it's too much, it, it, revelation is too intense, so please, God, M Moshe, we don't want God to speak to us, we want Moshe to speak to us. They, come to, they approach Moshe and they said, you speak to us, God should not talk to us, we may die. So, so, um, so that's, that's the end of that. Now, the next mitzvah 
is already God talking to Moshe, and Moshe has to convey to the people. So I'm looking, if you're on the out scroll, I'm looking at 413. If not, you can follow along, no problem. Looking at chapter 20, verse, 30, verse 19. And here God gives a few commandments. Now, two of the commandments make sense. I understand why God is giving it. The other ones, I don't understand. So let's see, what's the first commandment? The first commandment is what? Don't, uh, on the Lord your God, don't serve idols. So it makes sense that right after the, after the Ten Commandments, this is reiterated. So that's indeed, it's reiterated. Verse 19, Hashem said to Moses, so shall you say to the children of Israel, you have seen that I have spoken to you from heaven. And therefore, you sh it doesn't say therefore, I'm, I'm adding the therefore, you shall not make images of what is like with me, gods of silver and gods of gold shall you not make for yourselves. Wonderful. It says what? It says, don't make idols. I understand. Out of the Ten Commandments, God's reiterating the first. Makes sense. Now we have a problem. Now, verse 21, verse 22, God, verse, well, the next three verses, God starts talking to us, to us about the altar. Now, I know nothing about the altar. The altar is not going to appear for another two portions where God says, make a temple, and in the temple, there should be an altar. So I know nothing about the altar. Right away, God says, oh, you're going to make an altar. This is how it should be made. What, what is the altar doing here? It doesn't belong here. It belongs in two portions from now. So that's the problem. That's problem number one. And problem number two, why is it so important that these mitzvot about the altar should be reiterated? So I'm going to read the three verses and tell you what the conventional interpretation is and then tell you a little bit, hopefully, if we have a minute or two, the Kabbalistic, Hasidic interpretation. So here we go. Verse, Rabbi, two yeah. question for you. Go ahead. What does Mizbeah actually mean? Does it mean altar? I don't know what altar means. <laughs> Right, so I never knew what that word meant. The etymology of Mizbeach is Zevach. Zevach is a um, offering, but a festive offering. There's different names in the Torah for offerings. There's a, there's a korban, which means like a sacrifice, but it means you, you're trying to come close to God. A Zevach is much more festive. Um, so a Zevach would be like you're making a, a, a 4th of July barbecue and you're, and you're inviting your friends. That's a Zevach. Um, the, in the Bible, we're... Um, if you want, we're, we're, we're uh, Jonathan, uh, David and Jonathan make the plan. They want to figure out if Saul wants to kill Jonathan. Um, so David tells Jonathan, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to skip a day. I'm going to skip a day. I'm going to skip the meal, the Rosh Chodesh meal. And if your father asks me where I am, say, oh, he asked permission to go because he has a Zevach Mishpacha. He has a Zevach, which is an offering with the family. It's a family party. So Zevach is a Offer, Zevach is an offering that, that is a festive offering. And, and in other words, you partake of the meat, you eat it. It's, it's different than the offerings that are just to God. And I'm, I'm pretty sure that Mizbeach is the verb. In other words, the place, it's a noun, but, it's the, but, but the noun has the form of a verb. Mizbeach is the place where you offer the offering, offer the Zevach, if you see what I'm saying. Right, so what's the difference between that and a Mishteh? Mishteh is primarily a, 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 um, a party with, with drinks, right? The difference in a Jewish party and in a Gentile party. You go to the Jewish party, the, the line is by the food. You go to the Gentile party, the line is by the bar, right? So that's what happens here. Mishteh is a party. They was, I'm sure there was some food, but it's primarily a, primarily a the word Mishteh means to drink. So it's primarily about the drink. And zevach is it's primarily about the steak. It's like, what's the difference between going to a bar or the steakhouse? In the steakhouse, you're also going to buy wine. Yeah, but in the steakhouse, it's about the steak. And then when you go to the, to, to the bar, they're also going to feed you something. You're also going to have a d'oeuvres, but it's a really about the drink. So we, when you get invited to a party, you look at the, at the at fine print, see if it's a mishta or it's a, a zevach. Okay, so that's um, 21. An altar of earth shall you make for me, and you, sh and you shall slaughter it's on it. They write near it, because that's the truth. But literally, it's on it, on it or near it. Uh, your elevation offerings and your peace offerings, your flock and your herd, wherever I permit my name to be mentioned, I shall come to you and bless you. Okay, we don't have time to explain everything, but um, make a mizbeach, make an altar of earth. And there you should offer your offerings. Not number two, verse 22. And when you make for me an altar of stones, do not build them hewn. In other words, don't build them with stone that you have to chop with metal. For, for you will have raised your sword over it and desecrated it. The Mizbeach, the altar, is a symbol of peace. And therefore, if you put 
um, we don't want any any metal as the sign uh, in the construction of the altar. Okay. Finally, verse last verse, and you shall not ascend my altar on steps, so that your nakedness will not be uncovered upon it. Well, we're talking about the priests, and the priests are not wearing pants; they are wearing, uh, I guess you can call it a robe. So if you're walking on a robe and you're walking up the steps, you may you may this the your your the robe may be elevated, go up, and it can expose the nakedness. And therefore, you should not have that. Therefore, you should have the a ramp. Very important technical detail. Is this the most important mitzvah? Is this what we need to know right after the giving of the Torah? Is this what we have to know at the conclusion of the, 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 the most amazing revelation of all times? By the way, you're going to build an altar, make sure it has a ramp, not steps. So I understand it's very important. We don't want to, uh, we don't want to, um, we want modesty, but according to the Kabbalah, there's much Hasidic philosophy, there's much more here. And this really, this captures the way we transition out away and channel the energy of the giving of the Torah. So in, in short, the thesis is going to be like this. The thesis is you have the giving of the Torah. You have this overwhelming experience. You have the revelation. And the people say, I can't handle this revelation. It's too much. Now we need to internalize it. Now the question is, what do I do the next day? How do I come close to God without God revealing himself to me? How do I recreate the, the, the inspiration of Sinai without God descending on Mount Sinai with thunder and lightning? In other words, how do I recreate that, that inspiration? There's the inspiration that comes down from above. That's the revelation at Sinai. And then there's the question, how do I recreate it? And that's a very important question because Sinai was a one-time thing. The Jews say, we don't want it anymore. It's not valuable. We want, to, we want to create the inspiration on our own. So that's why God says, oh, you want to create the inspiration of a, a, on your own? Create an altar. That's why the altar is so important, because the altar reminds us of Sinai. The only difference is, because what is an altar? An altar is a raised earth. So earth represents physical, and raising the earth, and raise, elevating the animal on top of the earth represents elevating the physical. So in some ways, the, 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 the altar is like a small mound. It's like a small mountain. So the difference is Sinai is God descending from above. But after Sinai is over, now we're called to create our own Sinai. We're, create, we're called to elevate ourselves. And that is, the, that, is the, that is the symbolism of the earth. By the way, it's a beautiful interpretation from Sham Shinafal here. She says like this. He says that, he says that um, Judaism doesn't have any symbols. When I don't have any symbols, that's what God says. God says, don't make any symbols. He just said it. Don't, lota suniti, don't make for me any, any symbols of God of silver. But he says, but and the other, other religions have symbols. He says, but the problem is you look around Judaism, you see there are some symbols. There's the menorah. You know, you stay a symbol of the state of Israel, but it's the symbol of, of, of Judaism in some sense. We have the, uh, sometimes you have all kinds of symbols. So what he says is as follows. He says, no, no, no. He says, a big difference. He says, other faiths, the symbol is a symbol for God. This is the symbol. This is, this is supposed to remind you of God. Judaism, no, no, nothing tangible can remind you of God. The symbol is to remind you of what you should become. So what is the menorah? It's not a symbol. You're not saying God is like the menorah. We're saying the people are like the menorah. The people are the ones who have to increase the light. And that's why we say there's seven branches in the biblical menorah, so there's seven types of Jews. But it's a very interesting thing. So the altar here is a symbol, not of God, but a symbol of what we have to become. So what is the altar? Raise the earth. Raise your, elevate yourself. After Sinai, you can't rely on God to elevate you. You have to elevate yourself. Fine, beautiful. That's very inspirational. We really can go off the call right now, but it's 10.35, we have five minutes left. So now we want to get to more details. Okay, so you told me that an altar is after Sinai. I can't expect God to inspire me. I have to elevate myself. Now the question is, how do I elevate myself? And here there's two models. There's the model of the step and there's the model of the ramp. And they're two different models and they'll achieve two different things. Both are important, but at the altar, right after Sinai, we say no to steps and yes to ramp. And that's the question, what are the steps? What are the ramp? Why is the steps no good and the ramp good? So let's talk about the science of ramps for a minute. Um, I was learning uh, science with my daughter in her science book. I don't remember from when I learned it in school. So I, I, I like to read her science books and they talk about the two, they talk about machines and one of the most primitive machines, the, the earliest machines is a ramp. 
What does a ramp do? A ramp makes it much easier to raise. Um, you can lift anything you want because you just extend the ramp further and farther, and then it's easier. You don't need as much effort. So step number one, difference between ramp and uh, st step is that a step, it takes effort. You're going to lift something, it takes effort. The ramp, uh, it doesn't take as much effort. In other words, you have, of course, uh, you're, you're extending the effort over, 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 over a period of time, over, over, over more space, but in the sense, it becomes easier. So in other words, what's easy, what, one difference between steps and, and a ramp is that the ramp is, becomes easier. It's not as difficult to, to ascend. That's difference number one. But that stems from the difference is that steps has distinct steps. Every step is distinct, separate, and a part of the step before. So I'm either on step number two or on step number three, and it's very clear what step I am. As opposed to the ramp, it's much harder to distinguish between the various levels of the ramp because there's no point that you say, okay, this is one mark, there's, there's no marks, it's just one long, it's, it's just one long ramp. This distinction is not um, felt as much. That's why it becomes easy because you don't see the, the, the division between step and step is not so great. It's gradual because it's gradual, it becomes easier. So we're identifying two points in the physical ramp and we wanna see what's the equivalent in the service of God or in the, or in the spiritual sense and also in the service of God. So the first difference is that a step would be more difficult and a ramp would be easier. But the more important difference is that a step, every step is distinct from the previous step and the ramp the distinctions melt away. You don't really recognize the distinctions. Okay, so what does this represent in the spiritual sense? Before we get to the human service of God. In the spiritual sense, we know, and this is a very basic Kabbalistic concept it's in every page of the Zohar, that there are two ways through which God interacts with the world. There's what they call the Or HaMimale and the Or HaSovev, the light that encompasses and the light that is invests itself in creation. Mimale fills the creation. In other words, what the Kabbalah is saying is that for me to be, for any creation to be created, you have to have divine energy that is internalized within that creation. And in fact, the properties of that creation is based on the divine light that is invested within that creation to give it, create, to, to bring it into existence. The problem is that the light of God is too intense to create it, to create anything, to be contained by anything. And therefore we say, that most of the light of, 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 of the infinite God is just surrounds the creation. When you say surrounds, we don't mean literal, we mean figurative, we mean that it's not internalized within the creation. And because it's not internalized within the creation, it just hovers above. But then there's a little bit of a ray of that light, of the, of the, of the light that encompasses, that goes in within every creation. And this is a very important concept. We could talk about it all day. Mimale and Saidev. The, Im the imminent light, the light that fills the world, and then the light that encompasses the world. And we could talk about this all day. A lot of what we're doing in the mitzvot is about uniting both those lights, trying to get more of the infinite light invested within the, the, finite, the finite light of God that, that comes into the world. Okay. Now, one of the differences between the inner light and encompassing light is that the inner light is like steps. In general, there are four spiritual worlds. Within every spiritual world, there's so many distinction, and steps represent distinction. Every level is on its own level. If you're in the level of Atzilut, you are on the higher step. If you're in the level of Asiya, you're in the lower step. Within every world, every sphera, there's a hierarchy. So steps is hierarchy, and steps is distinction, and that's because of the light that in the light of God that fills every creation, um, fills every creation um, based on its own properties, and therefore that creates a distinction. If you look at the light that encompasses, so the Kabbalah says the most spiritual world on the lowest world compared to the, to the light that encompasses, it's the same. There's no distinction because that light is greater than both. So you say, who's greater? Is, uh, um, <clears throat> who is greater? Um, I'm, I'm just trying to think of an example of when you have something that is so great. Okay, who's great? You look in the first grade. And you say, there's two students. Who's the smartest kid in the first grade? Okay, the smartest kid. In the first. Who's the kid that's the least smart in the first grade? Okay, that's him. Fine. Now, there's a big distinction between them. But if you bring Albert Einstein into the room, then the difference between these two levels pales in comparison to them compared to the overwhelming light of the great scientist. So the point is, when you're bringing something that's, that's much greater than, than the system, then the differences between, within the system, they become less, 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 um, 
less, um, they become less, less apparent and less felt. So that's the first step. That's the philosophical step. And then the next step was going to try to explain how this means in our own service of God. But just to summarize, there's the model of the step. The step is every level is distinct from the other step. So the steps, when you hear steps, we're talking about the light of God that is enclosed within every creation, the limited ray that's enclosed within every creation and creates a distinction between creations. And that's the step. And then if you're talking about Seva, the moment you hear ramp, the moment you hear ramp, ramp means I don't really see distinction between levels. How could there not be a distinction between levels? This kid's smarter than the other kid. The first grade, this guy got 100, this guy got an 80, this guy got a 60. Yeah, but compared to the infinite light, the distinctions are, are not significant. They're all insignificant compared to the great scientist. So compared to the infinite light, the world of Atsilut and the lowest world are all the same. They're all insignificant. So that's the Ar Hasoyev, that's the encompassing light. Okay, what does this have to do with us? So now, when I want to come close to God, there's two ways to come close to God. One way to come close to God is through internal transformation. That's steps. The problem with internal transformation is, number one, it's hard. Number two, it takes time. So every day I have to grow a little bit. You can't jump 15 steps at once right? Today I have to work. And when you go up a step, you go up a step and then you elevate yourself and then you're on the next step and then you have to hang out there for at least a moment, right? You can't just jump. So the point here is you go from step to step. It's gradual. If you're looking at internal transformation, I want to become a more kind person. I want to become a person more loving of God. I want to become a person who's more aware of spirituality. That's internal transformation. I want to change how I understand and how I feel. Internal transformation has to happen through steps. It has to be gradual. And what I do is, so it's wonderful because it creates transformation, long lasting transformation. It's wonderful. The pro, but everything in the Kabbalah has two sides of the coin. The problem is if you're internalizing the light of God and that light of God and that awareness is making you a better person because you're internalizing it. If you're internalizing it, by definition, you're not reaching the essence because you can't internalize the essence. How do you internalize the essence? How do you internal? How do you connect to the light that encompasses everybody equally? She says that's by doing a mitzvah because you're submitting to the word of God. I'm doing it because God tells me to do it. Here, on one hand, you say it doesn't transform me, it doesn't change me, but on the other hand, by that submission, what that gets me is that gets me the encompassing light. That gets me. I what I'm basically saying is it really doesn't matter what level I am on because. Even if I have a little bit more of love to God, a little less to love to God, either way, I'm insignificant compared to the, to the infinite light. So if I really want to connect to God, it's not about understanding a little bit more. It's not about becoming a little kinder. That, is, that, 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 that step, that's one step up is insignificant compared to the encompassing light. So the way I connect to the encompassing light is by submitting to it, by doing God's will. So in other words, there are two models of coming close to God. Which one is, which one is necessary? The answer is yes. The answer is both are necessary. Each one has an advantage. When I change internally, I transform myself internally, then that's internal transformation. That's wonderful. The Mali Kalaman, that's the light of God entering me and transforming me. That's wonderful. The problem is that if it's I'm internalizing it, I'm not reaching the essence. How do I reach the essence? For that, I have to submit to something much greater than myself. And so the concept of, now let's go back. In one sense, what's easier? Is it easier to transform or is it easier just to commit to, to submit and do God's will? In one sense, it's easier to just submit because it doesn't take a lot of work. I just have to accept. So we say that's what the ramp is. What is the ramp? A ramp has two, two properties. Number one, there's no distinction between level and level because we're referring to the infinite light that is above all distinctions between levels. On the other hand, paradoxically, it's actually easier to touch, not to internalize, but to touch the infinite light, because the ramp, the function of a ramp is to make it easier to climb. So now what we're saying is as follows. After the giving of the Torah, you want to recreate the, the revelation of God. You want to recreate Sinai. It has, you have to take a two-pronged approach. And the two-pronged approach is you have to begin with the ramp. Begin by saying, I want to touch the infinite light. The way I touch the infinite light is submission. That's step number one. Because why? Because by internalization, I'm never going to get to the essence because you can never internalize the essence. After that comes next parsha. What's next parsha? Eila mishpati. These are the ordinances that you have to study. These are the mitzvot that make sense. What does that represent? 
after you submit to the infinite light, after you climb the ramp, now you can start climbing the stairs. Now you can go step by step, internalizing the Torah, internalizing the teachings, transforming the self. And there's always a, 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 an advantage and a disadvantage to each model. And the advantage of internalization in next week's parsha is that I become a better person. I become transformed. My perspective changes. I have internalized the, the message of Judaism. The problem, of course, is that if I can internalize it, it's not the essence. So I need both. So according to the Kabbalah, there's the model of the steps, the model of the, of the ramp. The steps means distinction. The steps means the male kolam and the light that, 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 that fills each creation. In other words, it's I have to grow step by step for internal transformation. The problem with that is that's step number two. That's not where you start. You start with the, with the ramp. You start with the idea that all levels are the same before God. And I'm not closer to him if I understand or if I don't understand because understanding is only external. I'm not going to get his essence. The only way I get to his essence is if I do what he wants. If I submit, if I submit, I don't know if submit's the right word, but if I connect by doing a mitzvah. Oh, on one hand, when I do a mitzvah, I'm climbing higher. I'm climbing higher. But when I climb higher, that's the quality. I'm getting the essence, but I cannot internalize it. What's the next step? The next step is Torah. What's Torah? Seeking to understand. That's next week's parsha. Seeking to understand. When I understand, I'm transformed, but it's a lower level. So each has an advantage of the other. So that's the story in short. A lot more to say. The good news is Rabbi Shneir Zalman said it in, th in four lines that ever said in the page and a half, but we still have to elaborate and explain. So thank you for joining. Any questions, comments, please share. Otherwise, have a wonderful Shabbos. And as always, it's very enjoyable for me to be able to study together. And thank you. And I really appreciate you joining us. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi. Um, that's a beautiful metaphor.